Oh, there's already people with questions. Great. I think uh, give them a chance to sit down and hear your first. Yeah, Mark Williams, Geisinger. This is actually a uh, uh, brief speech uh, guised as a question. Um, so uh, I, this was related to Anne, and I just wanted to reflect that it was very interesting to see those results because it reflects almost exactly what we saw uh, when we did our extensive community engagement with our Geisinger members uh, to inform our MyCode Community Health Initiative. We were concerned that what we were seeing was perhaps a local phenomena because we've been embedded with that community for a century. And so we had very high levels of trust. But as we've now extended that into a different area where we haven't had a presence, specifically Atlantic City, which um, you might suspect looks slightly different than central Pennsylvania, <laughs> um, we are seeing exactly the same results, which are very concordant with yours. So again, I think that uh, this really reflects the idea that we need to be uh, in, informed by those folks as opposed to a bunch of smart people that can think up doomsday scenarios sitting around a table and let that drive policy. Yeah, thank you for that. Any comment, Anna? You're right, right we can. Nothing really other than I totally agree <laughs> with what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, what's so lovely about doing a broad public survey is that you reach people that often don't take part in this sort of research. Um, and with such a broad education background and socio-demographic backgrounds, and including all really um, hard to reach people that don't normally take part in surveys as well, it's fantastic to see that there's no, no surprises really out there. Other questions? Yes. It's for David. Um, what has changed with the prior um, sensi uh, sensitive um, data regulation and with the new uh, regulation? That's a nice question. Um, I would say um, not as much as one might have thought. The directive, um, and the, uh, could have, I could have put a similar sort of uh, graphic up with the direct, uh, for the directive as for the regulation, just that the numbers have shifted around a bit. The, the degree of uh, protection is very much the same. The, the, uh, um, I think the, the additions are things like the, uh, the, the risk assessment. The sanctions are much stronger. That's absolutely the case. But I actually think for research, the opportunities are slightly better than they were under the directive. But I think, in a sense, it's more of the same, which perhaps reflects the way it took so long to get to uh, the, the ledger, to, onto the statute book. It took four years of hard negotiation, and I think over the time it just came back towards what was already there. So I don't think it's much change, actually. It's perhaps then we didn't take the opportunities that were there for us under the directive, actually. Yeah, maybe. Uh, just a quick question for Jennifer before we go back to the mics. Uh, we were talking about pop popular cu culture and having um, co-chaired the health data governance. Without naming cultures, how, could you see um, in, the, in the endless revision of all those recommendations and mecha mechanisms and so on, um, more cautious approaches or did the attitudes of the different countries and so on that were there present reflect the absence or, or presence of healthcare systems or a suspicion of DNA? What were your overall observations on some of the cultural influences on, on the, in the debate? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned, this was a rather innovative um, action by the OECD because it had literally in one part of the OECD, the folks who worked on data protection and security. And these tended to be heavily dominated by lawyers and IT people. In another part of the OECD with another committee, um, they worked on health, various health issues, and these tended to be people, health professionals and people who were really concerned about individuals and populations. So the marriage of those two um, attitudes, I guess, those two world views and experiences took a long time, which is why the committee started working in 2014. And um, we had some 40 experts named by all the various countries and we went through rounds of discussion. And there you would see some would be patients advocates, some would be very, very, um, orthodox, 
silo approach to data, very, very worried that this was just a, the beginning of the end um, in a, a very loosey-goosey approach to, to privacy. Um, and I don't know that those, those particular voices have been reconciled, but what is interesting, I think, is that the uh, Privacy and Security Committee realized that it had to put a bit of water in its wine, so to speak, because um, a big driver for the OECD is the cost of health care in all its countries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it realized that it had to, I guess, be more flexible in uh, working to a real-life application of privacy and security principles. But a lot of those tensions still exist, and that's why I think the OECD work on implementing them is so important, because in your own countries, you have to work around these persisting attitudes. Thank you. We'll take the two questions together. So go ahead, please. And after that, we take a break. Uh, this is for Anna. Uh, with regards to the attitudes um, uh, for uh, for-profit um, uses, um, I noticed that it was uh, labeled as Big Pharma, and could that be attitudes towards Big Pharma, which we know is not always good, uh, or were there, was there more nuance in that other for-profit companies include software developers, um, for instance, Google, um, and other uses uh, such as that that don't elicit that negative response. Next question, then we'll take them. Go ahead. So it's great to hear the um, GDPR being presented as an opportunity rather than the problem, um, and, and that the GA3GH is involved with that. But what can you as individuals or institutions do to, to, to gain the benefit? Thank you. All right, Anna, you're on, and then David. Mm -hmm. So we did um, describe the difference between medical doctors, non-profits, researchers, and for-profit researchers. And we were very careful to articulate that for each of those groups, um, people still benefit. So even the non-profit researchers um, may get increase in grants or funding or publications or recognition by having access to data and data sharing. Um, and you know, and the same for clinicians who get recognition for getting a diagnosis right because they've ac access data. So it's not as if these other groups are neutral. People are benefiting all round. Um, we did also describe, that there, so Big Pharma was just a sort of a, a summary way that we used in, in the films to describe the for-profit industry. Um, but in the glossary terms that you could access when you hover your mouse over the term, you can get more of an extensive description of what the for-profit industry could be described as. But I totally acknowledge, yes, it, you know, it could well be biasing towards a particularly negative view. Mm -hmm. David? Well, I think that the way that we can have an impact here is because um, the Article 40 Code of Conduct is an invitation for, uh, for, from the bottom up, really. It's from different sectors to provide the granularity of how the, this general data protection regulation, which is supposed to cover everything, actually works in your area. And so the first thing is we can make sure that we've got um, a, a robust and sensible version for our area. Uh, and I think we've hopefully showed some of those uh, ways that that can work. Um, and how we can feed into the discussion at the BVMRI, feed into the drafting, feed, make sure that what goes to the Commission as a, a, as a sensible uh, code of conduct would work. And then I think the other part of it is, this, is the public uh, opinion stuff. I think that's really lacking at the moment because there's also that fear in amongst the regulators, in amongst the supervisory authorities, in amongst the courts, that somehow if we, if we take a, a, a lighter line on this or we, we open up a, a more uh, pro-data sharing, pro-genomic work uh, line, somehow this, the, the, the great public will be against this. But I think this, inf this information now, this, this evidence shows that this isn't the case. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how you deal with the range of sensitivities that this shows. It's not, you know, if, if, there's, if there's 46%, there's, there's also 54%. So how we manage that is really important. But this is the bedrock for actually making a, a big impact in not just regulation, but in governance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, folks, I have to tell you, you only have a 15 
minute uh, coffee break as we want to end on time, but I think uh, in spite of that, we can still uh, thank our, our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>